Sometimes it's really easy to get lost in electronics, especially when you're just getting started. I mean, everything nowadays has a microcontroller in it, needs to be connected to the computer, or there is an app to control it. And I'm guilty of this too, because I talk a lot about microcontrollers here on this channel, but not today. Because sometimes it is nice to just go back to the basics. So today I want to show you how you can build a simple electric calendar. For every day there is a switch and an LED where you can manually increase the date every day. This way you can read off the date simply by counting LEDs. But that can take some time plus it's a bit boring. And that's why I will show you how you can modify an ordinary panel meter and add it to the calendar so that the position of the needle points to the current day. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics. And yes, this is pretty simple, but I think also pretty unique. I mean, who has a calendar like this at home or in their office? And all you need is a 5 volt power source and I will use a normal USB power supply for this. Next we need a matching USB connector, one toggle switch that works as the on off button for our calendar and then for each day you need an extra toggle switch, a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor and an LED. And finally you need a panel meter and don't worry if you cannot get this exact one here, I will show you in great detail how you can make it work with just about any panel meter that you can get your hands on. And for that we will also need a 25 turn 100 ohm potentiometer. To mount everything I will use this old picture frame here together with this sheet of black rigid foam board that is solid enough to hold components but quite easy to drill and cut. And as usual you can find everything you need in the companion article on friendlywire.com. And before I forget you will also need a multimeter and a simple one like this one here will do just fine. The main idea of the calendar is really simple. Every day we turn on an additional LED. When we connect all of these LEDs in parallel, then the total current that flows through this entire circuit here gets bigger the more LEDs are turned on. And if every LED takes the same amount of current, then we can use the total current to count the number of days. Let's say every LED takes 1 milliamp, then a current of say 12 milliamps would then mean 12 days. And that is exactly what we then read off in the panel meter. And the cool thing is, this is all passive components, just switches, resistors and LEDs. No integrated circuits, no microcontrollers and it all works right out of the box. So to do this we actually have to solve two problems. The first one is, how do we supply an LED with a more or less constant current? And then second, how do we actually measure that current with a panel meter? If we want to run an LED at a fixed power supply voltage, like 5V in our example today, we need to limit the current and a simple way to do that is to use a resistor in a circuit like this. Every LED needs a minimum voltage to light up and that voltage is called the forward voltage. For green LEDs that we use today, this voltage is around 2.2V. Now the sum of the voltage across the LED and across the resistor has to be 5V because that is provided by our power source. Across the LED we have the forward voltage which is fixed to the value of 2.2 volts for green LEDs. This means that across this resistor we have to lose the rest of that voltage, so 5 minus 2.2 volts which is 2.8 volts. Now we need to decide what current to run this LED at and around 1 milliamp is a good choice for signal lights that do not need to be super bright. And then we can use Ohm's law which says that voltage U is current I times resistance R. Solving this for R, our resistance here is 2.8 volts divided by 1 milliamp, which is 2.8 kilo ohms. I only had 2.2 kilo ohm resistors at home, so I am using them. In this case, we can turn our math around. We want the voltage drop across the resistor of 2.2 kilo ohm to be 2.8 volts. So we can take again Ohm's law and calculate, this time for the current, that it will be 2.8 volts divided by 2.2 kilo ohm which is around 1.3 milliamps and that is still perfectly fine for our LEDs. Now this method is very simple and keep in mind that this only works properly if the supply voltage doesn't change and there are no other voltage drops in the circuit. So what if we run this circuit here at 4.5 volts instead of 5 volts? The forward voltage across the LED is still 2.2 volts, that never changes, but the voltage across the resistor is now only 2.3 volts. And when we use Ohm's law again, and we will be doing that a bunch more later today, we find that the current is now only 1.1 milliamps. This is smaller than what we got before and it would make the LED shine not as bright. So same resistor but different current, all because the operating voltage changed. 
But as long as we can guarantee that the voltage will stay more or less the same, nothing bad will happen to the brightness of the LED. And with that out of the way, let's have a look at the schematic. So we can now imagine that we place all our LEDs in parallel, each one with a separate switch and resistor, so that we can turn them on and off one by one. This here on the left is the power adapter where our 5 volts come from and this switch here is our main on off switch. And for simplicity I'm only showing 4 LEDs here but you get the idea. And actually I will only use 24 LEDs today because I want to use this as a Christmas calendar but the principle is exactly the same if you want to use 30 or 31 LEDs because the total current still increases by roughly 1.3 milliamp per LED. All right, now that we have sorted that out, how do we actually measure that current with a panel meter? The important part is this resistor here. It is called a shunt resistor. And instead of giving it a fixed value, we are using a precision potentiometer with 25 turns here. Basically, when all LEDs are on, we adjust this resistor so that the needle of the panel meter is at the maximum of the scale. This is how we will calibrate our setup. Now what resistor value is right for you depends of course on the panel meter that you are using. But don't worry about this, you can use a simple multimeter and make two measurements and then you will know exactly what resistor value you have to use. And we don't even have to be crazy accurate with our measurements because it's the potentiometer, it's adjustable. So let's take one of these panel meters apart and figure out how they work on the inside. When opening up a panel meter, like the one we are using today, we usually find two things. A combination of a coil and a spring that move the needle across the scale and there is usually also a resistor in there somewhere. Let's forget about that resistor for now and look at the coil. The coil works as an electromagnet. When we send current through that coil, it becomes a magnet and we say that it creates a magnetic field. And the more electric current we send through it, the stronger that magnetic field becomes. Okay, but because the coil is surrounded by permanent magnets that point in the opposite direction, the coil is pushed away from those magnets. That moves the needle that is attached to the coil across the scale. But that alone is still not enough because this way the coil would just spin until the magnets align perfectly and then be stuck there forever. Not good. This is where the spring comes in. This spring is a so-called torsion spring and it is attached to the coil and the body of the panel meter. Now imagine that we send a small electric current through the coil. The electromagnet turns on and the needle starts to move but now the spring tries to pull the needle back into its initial position. The more the needle moves the stronger the spring pulls until the forces of the magnets and that of the spring cancel each other exactly and we reach a point of equilibrium where the needle stops to turn. If the flowing current is bigger, the same thing happens just further down the scale because the magnetic repulsion is stronger. And if the current is smaller, the needle ends up further left on the scale. So the position of the needle is a direct indicator of the electric current that is flowing and that's exactly what we need for our calendar. But I'm just talking here on YouTube, I mean how does it all work like in real life? The panel meter we are using today is a voltmeter. This one here is for 50 volts but it doesn't matter, you can get one for 12 volts or 25 volts or basically any other voltage. This is because every panel meter has two important numbers we have to figure out. First is the saturation current, also called ISAT. That is the current that maxes out the scale and it's usually in the low milliamp range. Half the scale is reached at half the saturation current, 10% of the scale at 10% of the current and so on. It's linear. For our example today, we just measure the current with our multimeter. We connect it in series with the panel meter and apply 5 volts which fills out 10% of the scale. And as you can see, the current that flows is 0.095 milliamps. This means that the total saturation current is 10 times that because 10 times 5 is 50 and that would be around 0.95 milliamps. The second important quantity is the internal resistance of the coil, also called R int. The coil is made up of wire and that wire has a resistance. To find that value, we have to first open up our panel meter and remove the resistor in series with the coil. This is not the internal resistance we are talking about. This resistor is actually the one that makes us a 50 volt panel meter, so we should remove it because we don't need it anymore and afterwards we can just close it up again. And real quick, make sure that you measure the saturation current before you remove this resistor because once this resistor is gone, the whole scale of the panel meter is completely meaningless. But now that this extra resistor is removed, when we connect our multimeter to the panel meter and set it to resistance measurement, we can directly read off the internal resistance R end. 
For our example today, it is 151 ohms. And yes, these two numbers, the saturation current and the internal resistance are really all that we need. Because now, you guessed it, we can use Ohm's law again. It tells us that when the saturation current of 0.95 milliamp flows through the coil, which has a resistance of 151 ohms, a voltage drop of 0.143 volts happens in the circuit. Okay, but what does that even mean? I mean, all we wanted to do was measure a simple current. Why do we need all of this? Trust me, we're almost there. All right, let's first simplify our circuit a little bit. Here is plus five volts, here are our LEDs, here is the panel meter with its internal resistance of 151 ohms and in parallel to it is the shunt resistor and at the bottom here is ground. Now in our application here we have 24 LEDs and we are running them at 1.3 milliamps each. This means the total current is 31.2 milliamps which is way too much for our panel meter. Remember it maxes out at 0.95 milliamp saturation current. So the idea is to divide the current and make sure that when the total current of 31.2 milliamp flows, only the saturation current flows into the panel meter and not more than that. What we need is a current divider and that's exactly what the shunt resistor does. Now one part of the current flows into the meter with its internal 151 ohms resistance and the rest goes through the shunt. But the voltage drop across the coil and the voltage drop across the shunt have to be the same because they are connected in parallel. This means that we can use Ohm's law again and calculate the shunt resistor value that way. Are you ready for some numbers? Alright, so we take the voltage drop of 0.143 volts and divide it by 31.2 milliamps minus 0.95 milliamps, which is 30.25 milliamps. And that gives us a value for the shunt resistor of 4.72 ohms. So off to the store and let's buy that 4.72 ohms resistor, right? Well, we actually don't have to do this. We can just use a 100 ohm adjustable precision potentiometer with 25 turns. This way we have roughly four ohms per turn and we can adjust it pretty accurately. Okay, but most likely you will not be able to get your hands on exactly the panel meter that I'm using here today in this video, but that's really not a problem. You can just calculate the shunt resistor based on the saturation current and the internal resistance just as we did in this video. But if that is a little bit scary for you or you don't wanna do it, don't worry because on friendlywire.com I programmed a panel meter calculator where you can just put in your information and then it'll tell you exactly what's the right shunt resistor value for you. You can find that calculator in the menu column of the article. Let's say you want to build a calendar that has 31 days and you want to drive it at 9 volts not 5 volts and you want to work with blue LEDs. You put that information in here and then you also need to give an LED resistor value and you can play around with it a bit but I think around 4.7 kilo ohms is a good choice in this case. And then you input the internal resistance and the saturation current for your panel meter that you have just measured and then you click on calculate. The calculator then shows you three numbers. The LED current and you can use that information to play a bit with the LED resistor value. It gives you the voltage drop, which should be not too large and less than 0.3 volts should be okay. And of course, it also gives you the shunt resistor value. And you see that in this case, you can also use a 100 ohm potentiometer, just like in this video. In fact, in most cases, a 100 ohm potentiometer will be just fine. And now that we've become experts in Ohm's law and we understand how everything works, we can finally build the circuit. So I started this whole thing by measuring out the panel meter, the switches and the LEDs and then I just played around a little bit until I found a layout where everything kind of was in place, it looked good and was spaced more or less evenly. I marked the locations with pencil lines and then began to drill the holes for the LEDs and switches. And this rigid foam board is very easy to work with, it drills very nicely, it cuts very easily, but it does make a mess. And last I marked the size of the panel meter and cut out the bigger hole and by now it was really time to clean the table. Then I removed the cover and started to screw the switches in place one by one followed by the LEDs and they also got a dab of hot glue each to keep them in place. I bent over the LED anodes and soldered them together. I connected the resistors to the central terminal of the switches and then to the LED cathodes. I connected all LED anodes and I connected the second terminals of the switches together. Finally the power adapter was mounted with hot glue and then connected to the on off switch. 
I then place the panel meter inside the foam board frame and fasten it in place with some brass screws. This matches the color of the frame nicely, I think. Next was the shunt potentiometer, which got connected in parallel to the panel meter and then I just couldn't wait any longer and connected power, turned on all LEDs and adjusted the potentiometer so that with all LEDs on, the needle maxed out the scale. With that working, I was quite relieved and I mounted the potentiometer on some extra foam board so it could be adjusted later if that ever became necessary. Then I placed the foam board inside the picture frame and fixed it all in place with extra amounts of hot glue. At this point everything was already working, but of course the scale was still showing 50 volts and not 24 days, so I needed to fix that. I scanned the scale and created a few alternative layouts in GIMP and printed them at the store on glossy paper. And these tiny small things here are actually supposed to be Christmas trees, it's a bit hard to see on camera. After cutting them out, I replaced the scale with a new one and that is a little bit fiddly with the screws and you have to be careful not to mess up the needle. But then finally, it was done. And what can I say, I really liked how it turned out. I mean, just look at all these LEDs and switches. It looks a bit messy on the back, yes, with all the hot glue. And you can definitely spot every single grain of dust on the black background. But as a Christmas calendar, this golden frame and the green LEDs just look amazing. And hopefully we will be able to use it for many years to come. And remember, you can make this a 30 or 31 day calendar simply by adding more LEDs and switches and by adjusting the shunt potentiometer. And if you want this to be a 30 and 31 day calendar at the same time, you can have two shunt potentiometers that you then calibrate separately and you switch between them for a month with 30 days and for months with 31 days with a simple toggle switch in a circuit like this one right here. And all of this just with passive components. I mean, how amazing is this? But is this method perfect? Unfortunately, the answer is no. The reason is that the voltage drop across the shunt resistor can become large and in that case, the LED current will change. Let's have another look at the simplified schematic. At the maximal current of 30.25 milliamps, the voltage across our shunt is around 0.143 volts. But that reduces the LED voltage down to 4.86 volts and that means the LEDs get less current, in this case only 1.21 milliamps each. The real problem is that the LED current depends on how many LEDs are turned on because that affects the voltage drop across the shunt. And that makes our setup non-linear and it only works well if the voltage drop across the shunt is small enough, so keep that in mind. But all things considered, I still think this calendar works extremely well and let's face it, we're not trying to sell this thing to NASA, so an accuracy of around half a day is probably good enough. Let me know if you have any questions or if you run into any issues when you're building this calendar yourself and I'll do my very best to get back to you. And more importantly, if you build this calendar yourself, please share it with me on social media. I always love seeing your creations. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what else you want to learn and I'll see you next time.